Hey everyone, today's video is on uh, is part of our SICU series on ventilator fundamentals. So this is going to be a very basic guide to kind of give you some practical knowledge to help you hit the ground running on your rotation when you start in the SICU, and then give you a foundation uh, to help you understand some of the basic modes, some of the basic vocabulary around ventilators, and serve as a springboard for you to then go in and do a much more deeper dive as you're taking care of these patients. All right, so the simplest way I find to think about the ventilator is to one, remember the two roles that it has or the two, um, really the two goals of breathing in general, and that is to perform oxygenation as well as ventilation. And so oxygenation, of course, is just ensuring that there's adequate blood, adequate oxygen supply to the bloodstream. And then ventilation re really just refers to CO2 and the ability to ventilate out or remove CO2, clear it from the blood, as it were. And these are typically measured ox oxygenation, most commonly through the uh, pulse ox or pulse oximetry, and uh, ventilation, uh, most typically through serial blood gases. <clears throat> when we're talking about oxygenation, you really have two key buttons or two key um, settings that you can change to titrate your level of oxygenation. For example, if it's inadequate and you want to titrate up the ventilator, how can you turn up the oxygenation as it were? And the obvious one is here at the bottom, the FiO2 or the fraction of inspired oxygen. Um, this is just a number ranging from zero to 100%. It just refers to how much of the gas that's being pumped into the patient is oxygen as opposed to something else. Remember, of course, that room air is 21%. Um, so increasing that number, anything above 21% is providing some extra oxygenation support above just breathing room air. However, the one that's easier to forget is the PEEP or the positive end expiratory pressure. Uh, what this really just means is what pressure is in that patient ventilator circuit after the patient exhales. And it's this constant baseline pressure that helps keep the alveoli of the lungs open. To give you some more basic numbers, a typical PEEP is usually measured in centimeters of water. Um, an initial PEEP for a vent setting might be something like five, maybe something like five to eight is a pretty typical starting PEEP for most ventilator settings. And again, I want you to really remember PEEP when you want to titrate oxygenation because FiO2, well, of course you can titrate it. Um, you don't want people to be breathing in really high uh, levels of oxygen for a long period of time. This actually paradoxically can cause um, some reactive toxicity from those high oxygen levels. So a lot of times it's better for the patient, uh, helps the lungs function a bit more naturally if you use PEEP to titrate oxygen up as opposed to FiO2. <clears throat> All right, and so if that's our oxygenation options, now what options do we have to titrate ventilation or again, looking at the partial pressures of the CO2 in the bloodstream. You again have two options. Your two options are the respiratory rate, RR, or the tidal volume. And now you have an even more clear winner between these two competitors for changing your PCO2. If your PCO2 is too high, you generally want to change your respiratory rate and not your tidal volumes. And we're gonna talk about this a bit more later, um, but in a nutshell, breathing more times a minute does less damage to the lungs than overinflating them. It's probably the easiest way to think about these two. We've learned that high tidal volume ventilation can actually be really bad for the alveoli and the lungs in general. So remember, if the PCO2 is high, your response should be to increase the respiratory rate or increase the tidal volume. Either way, you're just trying to get more air through the system essentially to help carry off that CO2. But if you have to choose, always choose to titrate up the respiratory rate and preserve those alveoli. All right, now we're going to move into some vent settings, which had to come at some point in this talk. But again, to be clear, there's a lot more to even the settings. There's obviously a lot more settings than what we'll talk about here. But there's a lot more detail even to the settings that we do talk about than what I'm going to be discussing. I'm not a critical care doctor. I'm not even a respiratory therapist. And so I'm definitely not the person you want going through this chart with you talking about how each one is triggered and cycled and controlled, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to just focus on the uh, absolute basics that you need to understand what's going on and get you started. You can always feel free to talk to your colleagues in respiratory therapy or read more about this on your own afterwards for your favorite settings. <clears throat> 
All right, so the first vent setting we're going to talk about is called pressure support, often abbreviated PS. Uh, this is kind of the most basic setting, which is why I'm starting with it. It's almost like CPAP um, to a degree, where there's a baseline PEEP. So remember, that's the positive end expiratory pressure, good for oxygenation. Um, so often you'll have a PEEP of something like 5. And then with each breath, the ventilator provides a little bit of pressure support, adds some pressure to that breath to make the breath a little bit easier. Often that's set to something like five as well. So a, a, a pressure support of, for example, they might refer to it pressure support five over five, usually just means a baseline peep of five with an additional support of five given to each breath. Uh, this is typically your uh, setting that you use when you're doing spontaneous breathing trials, which we will talk about later as well. All right, the next group of vent settings that we'll talk about are the assist control vent settings. Um, sometimes these are called conventional ventilation modes. And really, even though it says assist control, what I want you to think about when you think about assist control settings is the patient having very little say uh, in what's going on. So the assist control is where you set the machine, and the machine does what the machine is going to do regardless of what the patient does. The machine is not adapting to the patient really in any way. Um, this isn't often used by surgeons in my experience, so we're really going to kind of <clears throat> just talk about the surface of it. But it is important because it's the foundation for some of the later modes. And so the control is usually set either based on pressure or pressure control or PC or volume. That's volume control or VC. And just like it sounds in the name, um, in pressure control, the machine is told to give a set number of breaths. And for each of those breaths, it gives the breath uh, at a certain pressure, and it will not go above that pressure. Volume is a similar idea, but just with volume, it's going to give a set number of breaths. It's going to give them to a specific tidal volume. All right, so now moving on to our adaptive vent settings, I'm only going to talk about one of these, um, and that is PRVC, which is the one we typically use at our institution. That's called pressure regulated volume control. Now this is adaptive, so it adapts its ventilator settings based on the data it's getting from the patient from the previous breaths. And note in the name, we have volume control here, right? VC, so as you might have guessed, volume control is essentially the underlying mode of this vent that it regulates the settings based on the pressure that it's feeling from the patient. Um, so that a way to put this in common English might be to say that the ventilator attempts to achieve a set tidal volume at the lowest possible pressure. And again, we want to control both volume and pressure to preserve those lungs as much as possible. And the final vent setting we're going to talk about is our biphasic vent settings. And our institution, these are typically referred to as APRV or bivent, just based on the, the make of ventilators that we use. And that stands for airway pressure release ventilation. And this is not a terribly common mode it's more of a rescue mode for patients that aren't doing as well it can be uh, an option to help assist especially their oxygenation and the way i think about this is almost like super bipap and what i mean by that is you set two pressures a high pressure and a low pressure and these are very high pressures so if you imagine you might put somebody on bipap oh it's on 12 over 8 or 16 over 8 something like that these pressures often start with a p high of 30 and then usually the P low or the low pressure is something like zero. And then there's a very relatively long time, like usually around five seconds, where the machine gives a pressure of 30. There's a constant background pressure, a peep really, of 30. And then for a very short time, like maybe half a second, that pressure is completely turned off. And that allows for a very brief moment of gas exchange. And then you have that high continuous pressure for the next five seconds and then a moment for gas exchange. And so again, it's almost like wearing a, BiPAP machine on your face that's set to a really high pressure and only lets off very infrequently to allow for gas exchange. Kind of the thought behind this is that these really high pressures help minimize the de-recruitment of the lungs with each breath or the alveolar collapse. And if you can minimize the alveolar collapse, you can imagine that every time if you have an alveoli, it collapses down, the surfactant, the cells, they all stick to each other and then they get popped open again. That's going to cause damage every time that happens. And so that's called atelectotrauma. And if there's a lot of collapse, you get a lot of atelectotrauma, and that's going to eventually 
impede your pulmonary function. And so a mode like this is designed to attempt to avoid some of that. All right, so we've talked about some basic event settings with, AP, with a PRVC. We've also talked about a rescue event setting in APRV, as well as a weaning or SBT event setting in pressure support. So what kind of event setting, if you're just, what should the default event setting be that I ordered for my patient? And generally I would stick with something like, at least our institution, it's something like a PRVC, where you set a PEEP of around five, and the FiO2 somewhere above room air, but not terribly high, maybe like 40%. And you also want to select a relatively low tidal volume, which is usually measured in cc's per kilogram, uh, something like four to six. So again, if you just to give you some numbers to start wrapping your brain around it, instead of all this theory, uh, this is a good starting point that you can then titrate from. We should say a bit more about tidal volumes. We talked about those in the beginning, how we usually don't want to titrate those to help protect the lung. And this is kind of where that data comes from. Uh, there was a pretty major trial back in New England Journal of Medicine in 2004, the ARSNET trial, and that showed that low tidal volumes, specifically they looked at six cc's per kilogram and compared these to normal tidal volumes, which were more like 12, and they found a significant mortality benefit. We're talking an absolute mortality benefit of about 10%, which is huge, absolute and mortality. Um, so this rapidly got widely accepted that low tidal volumes are the way to go in critical care. And that's why that's yet another number that you want to have stuck in your head. Low tidal volume ventilation and think about that four to six cc's per kilogram. So like we talked about in the other slide, you're starting out in the sick you, you've got a patient, you don't know what to do. Just start with your basic settings, usually PRVC. Remember, this is a pressure regulated volume control. But all you really need to know is that it gives us given volume at the lowest pressure possible and adapts to the patient. Start with a reasonable PEEP, something like five. Um, a reasonable FiO2, something a little bit above room air, and then low tidal volumes, and you're good to go. And then you titrate it, thinking again about your oxygenation and your CO2. And so you can always just look at the pulse ox for your oxygenation, and you can adjust the PEEP for the FiO2 to help with that. Remember not to forget the PEEP. And then you, once you put someone on the ventilator, you usually want to get a blood gas and maybe an hour later, and you usually get those blood gases every one to two hours to help adjust your um, ventilation, most typically by making small tweaks to your respiratory rate. All right, so let's say you've done these basics and unfortunately your patient is not doing well despite increasing these vent settings. Maybe your FiO2 is up to 80, 90%. Maybe your PEEP is at 10 and you're like, what do I do? What's the next step from here? So the next, the few good next steps to have in your head that are generally supported by data. Um, and I always find it comforting, even if your patient's doing well, just always know what are these next steps I could take if I would need to. That always helps me think more clearly in stressful situations, many of which you find in critical care. Um, one option is paralysis. Oftentimes part of the issue is that the patient and the ventilator have asynchrony, which just means the patient is, wants to breathe like a normal person and the ventilator wants to breathe like a machine. And these two are often not the same. And so paralyzing the patient can reduce this to synchrony and allow the ventilator to, to work more efficiently. Um, another adjunct with data behind it is prone positioning. This is where the patient is actually flipped completely prone from their supine position every few hours. and lays there in that prone position for a certain number of hours before being flipped back into the supine position. You can imagine that with all the tubes and lines hanging out of patients and with the ever increasing size of our patients, this is a very unpopular thing to do with the healthcare staff. It's somewhat dangerous both to them and the patient. Patients get pressure ulcers, et cetera, but it does tend to improve oxygenation by changing the, the way the lungs lay. And then we talked about this before, this one doesn't have as much data as the previous two, but APRV is an option um, if you need better oxygenation despite your increasing vent settings. And finally, of course, always remember the ACE in the hole, uh, ECMO, extracorporeal membranous oxygenation. You could of course use VV if you just need the oxygenation CO2, essentially pulmonary support, or if the patient's hypotensive on pressors, et cetera, maybe VA would be a better option. So that's also something um, to keep in mind if ventilation isn't working too well for you. All right, on the other end of the spectrum, the happier end of the spectrum, 
a lot of your patients are going to do very well. And then the question is going to be, when can we stop ventilating them? When can we take them off the ventilator? This is actually a more important question than it may seem because every breath on the ventilator is a bad breath. Um, I want you to have that in your head. There's no such thing as a physiologic breath on the ventilator. We're designed to have a diaphragm that causes negative pressure and every breath on the ventilator is a positive pressure breath. It's completely not physiologic and it absolutely will cause damage to the lung over time, no matter how well we set our vent settings. And so the shorter you can have a patient on the ventilator, the better. And that's why the practice has come up in probably most ICUs in the world to do what are called regular spontaneous breathing trials. And that's where you take a patient, you put them on fairly minimal vent settings, wean some of their sedation and just see how they do. Um, because oftentimes patients will surprise us and people that we don't think are ready to extubate are actually much farther along than we think. So every patient every day should get an SPT um, as long as they're not clinically unstable, usually with either increasing ventilator requirements, requiring lots of pressors, et cetera. And so again, to give you some concrete examples, an example SPT at our institution is usually something like uh, you flip the patient to pressure support. Remember, this is just the mode that's almost like a CPAP where it gives you that constant background pressure, usually a PEEP of five, and then with each breath, we'll give you a little bit of support on top of it, usually um, an additional five centimeters of water. And then you just have them on some sort of, whoops. Sorry about that. And we usually just have them on some sort of reasonable FiO2 and what reasonable is, you know, kind of varies, but you know, something that you could give them while they're off a ventilator, something like 30%, 40% that you could deliver through other methods besides an ET tube. And then you have them attempt to breathe with this for about 30 minutes and you just see how they do. See, do they desat? Um, do they get tachycardic, et cetera? One kind of hard number to look at is called the RISB or RSBI. That's the rapid shallow breathing index, which is calculated by putting the respiratory rate over the tidal volume with a lower respiratory, sorry, with a lower RISB being better. Um, but if you, again, need to think of a number, definitely want that RISB less than 100. Often it will be much less than 100, something like 30 uh, when the patient's ready to extubate. And so if you think about what this would be like with these numbers, you want people that are not struggling to breathe, that usually signal by them not having to breathe a bunch of times with those shallow breaths and taking nice, adequate tidal volumes. Um, one other thing I wanted to point out is that we have these patients, you do want some sort of support typically for these patients because they are breathing through a straw. It's generally more difficult to breathe through an ET tube in the circuitry of a ventilator than it is just to breathe room air. So it is important to give them that little bit of positive pressure support. All right, so to review, remember we have two goals for the ventilator, just those same two goals for our breathing. Um, that's to manage our oxygen and manage our carbon dioxide. With oxygen, you can manipulate this with PEEP or FiO2. Generally, I prefer PEEP first. With CO2, you can get this by changing your respiratory rate. Increasing that will decrease your CO2 or increasing your tidal volume. But again, you generally want to favor respiratory rate to minimize trauma to the lungs. When in doubt, pick event setting PRVC with low tidal volumes. Um, don't be afraid to ask for help, ask your respiratory therapists or even your pulmonary critical care colleagues if things get much more confusing than that. And then also remember that every breath with a ventilator is a bad breath. It's a non-physiologic breath. So always, always, always be thinking about, can I SVT this patient? Can I get them off the ventilator support and extubate them as soon as possible? Good luck. Uh, the SICU is a stressful place, but you will learn a ton. Um, these videos are for educational purposes only, to not use them to diagnose or treat any diseases, and we will see you next time.